We have a number of common terms and thoughts here in the world that do not really tell the story they're supposed to tell. And as a result of that, we have come to the conclusion, which is quite erroneous, that we are as old morally, mentally, and emotionally as we are physically. That if the physical body begins to get a little decrepit, they become elders. And now we have the term maturity, which is generally attributed to a phys con physical condition of retirement, but actually simply stands for integrity or the adulthood of our minds, emotions, and inner convictions. We term an adult now anyone who is able to vote or drive a car. Actually, this statement is completely erroneous. An adult is a person who lives on the level of a realistic integrity relating to his humanity. We are human beings, and as human beings we are under universal law. And it is our reaction to universal law that determines the degree of adulthood that we have reached. An adult now is a person who is legally permitted to attend X pictures, who is legally entitled to be an alcoholic and to commit all kinds of misdemeanors which children are not allowed to have. So that today a great many younger people are waiting impatiently until they are old enough to commit a variety of delinquencies. Therefore, an adult to us mostly is a person who can do things that are not proper for a younger person to do, and perhaps is beyond the capacity of the elder person. Somewhere in between, we consider ourselves to have the right to think that we are a mature human being. Actually, the term maturity as we use it now is a grand illusion. It has very little to do with value. It has very little to do with the levels upon which human beings function. You know, notice, of course, that mankind has a certain unique place in the physical environment in which we live. Human beings have the power to question to ask, and for that matter, to rationalize their own existences. Animals do not do this. Animals are completely governed by group intelligences. They do what their kind is supposed to do. And we have outgrown this. We no longer do the things that our, kind are suppo our kinds are supposed to do. We break all the rules because we have will and individuality and personal intellectual. We are not anywhere near mature. If a mature person comes along, they're apt to be crucified. They're apt to be disgraced and dishonored because maturity demands integrity, and integrity is in short supply and even shorter demand. We do not really want to grow up. We want to remain in a world of childlikeness or childishness. We want to live in a world where someone else does our thinking for us, where we are protected in every way possible, where we do as little as we can and gain as much as we are allowed to gain from our efforts. We expect to be supervised, we expect to be protected, catered to, and even come under a benevolent care of an invisible deity. We are not ready to stand on our own feet, do our own thinking, and create appropriate codes for personal conduct. As we notice in a great many television programs that are coming through, particularly on Station 28, there are a great many nature studies. Many of these nature studies are most illuminating and inspiring. Most of all, however, they tell us 
that these various creatures live under laws, that these laws were not created by them, and they have absolutely no way of amending them. They simply fulfill the problems of survival and uh, perpetuation. They have within themselves a mysterious code which tells them what to do, and some of the things they do are almost unbelievable. We must almost believe that each of these creatures has a tremendous storehouse of individuality, but this is not the case. The bird that builds the extraordinary nest is following impulses, instincts, and attitudes within itself, peculiar to its kind, and it will seldom violate the laws of its kind. Therefore, we say with Aquinas that there are no such things as sinful animals. There are no plants that are delinquent. All of these forms of life are by nature and inherent pressure the creatures of integrity. They do the job they came to do. They live the way they are supposed to live. And they are all gathered together into groups, types, genera, structures, and systems by which they maintain and perpetuate themselves rather well until mankind comes in and spoils things for them. Today we are also to remember that the individual is no longer under animal controls. He is under the control of his own mind. He has the right to create his own way of life. But this does not give him an excuse for delinquency. Man, because he is capable of knowing what laws are and why they are, and through experience justify their need, because of these elements within himself, the human being is capable of judging and planning a career. If at the time he makes these plans he is very young, then he must depend upon education to give him a basic working outline. Education for the human being is sh should be developed strongly on the, on the principle of responsibilities. He has duties to himself. He has duties to his kind, the humanity of which he is a part. He has, a, has duties to nature around him, over which he has a certain... Uh, domination as a gardener or worker in this particular world. He has responsibilities from the cradle to the grave, and these responsibilities he must fit himself for. If he fits himself properly for the responsibilities of living, he will have a reasonably constructive and helpful life. He will be respected by others, and he will respect himself. If, however, he loses sight of all the rules which every other creature in the universe must obey, and starts out on a solo flight to the satisfaction of his own appetites, he will very soon be in serious trouble. And the more serious the trouble is, the more rapidly it spreads through society. The delinquent individual is not only damaging himself, but he is damaging the entire human race and for that matter is extending into all the other kingdoms of nature in one way or another. Man today is destroying not only his own way of life, but the very planet on which he is living. Now, the universal law also has certain curbs on it. He can go so far and no further can he go, because after he reaches a certain point, his various conducts become autocorrective. The individual either reaches a point where he understands and mends his ways, or continues as he was and vanishes from this sphere of activity. We see this around us today. We see it in practically every problem that confronts us. Somewhere along the line, man came to the erroneous conclusion that he could do as he please, pleases. This is simply not true. He must please to do that which is right. And we see this constantly in human relationships. We see it in the relationships of nations. We watch with very grave anxiety 
the results of human ambitions that have been allowed to become maniacal, that have become beyond control. All of these things come back to us in the problem of our own maturity. We start out in life comparatively innocent creatures, but let us not deceive ourselves. Within each innocent creature there are potentials. These potentials have to be developed. Life has to be built and unfolded in a reasonable manner. No two persons in the human kingdom are exactly alike. Each one has a personality. Each one has a degree of growth. Each one, however, possesses the power to estimate what he knows and what he does not know. He has the right to improve himself to a degree at least. He has the right to choose that which is best for himself so far as he knows. This the problem of the selectivity of living is not present in the animal kingdom. It is part of man's peculiar endowment. By this the individual can say to himself, I will be a good businessman, I will be a doctor, a lawyer, I will be a worker, I will do that which my own innate capacities permit me to do. And in order that my capacities may be a little more than that by which I came into the world, we have the idea that I will become educated, that I will learn a trade, that I will study a profession, and that I will do one thing or another to make myself more valuable to society and therefore receive greater recognition from society. These things are personal decisions, and these decisions become the basis of growth and the development of our lives. Now, every child has to pass through certain stages toward adulthood. This is the body itself building its own way in life. It is the body gradually becoming capable of maintaining the dweller that lives in the body. One Carl Jung calls the person in the body. In other words, before he can settle down to a useful life, the individual has to build a house. This house is primarily his own body. This body is variously conditioned by circumstances. Some have better starts than others. Some have more problems to face than others. But everyone in his own place must try in every way possible to build into life that which is most necessary to an adulthood of usefulness. To fail to do this is to become a failure in nature. And in all kingdoms except the human, failures do not survive long. With us they survive a little longer, apparently in the hope of redemption. Actually, the building up of a career and a body to sustain it, these are the labors of growth. These are the things we study for. These are the problems which we face in an effort to understand the world in which we live. For, uh, unfortunately, we are not being given the cooperation we need in most cases. Many families, the parents are completely self-interested or perhaps very tyrannical and demand absolute uh, equality for themselves, but nothing for the children. This type of thing does damage the young person. Broken homes, various inconsistencies of economics and social conditions, political upheavals, all of these things interfere with the natural growth of the individual. Strangely enough, the animal kingdoms and the plants also have problems. They are uh, subject to all kinds of natural calamities. They are subject to earthquakes and droughts they are, and tidal waves, cyclones. They are subject to many types of infestations and things of this nature. But the animal kingdom keeps quietly on its way and it does not change its own conduct to make it easier to live under an unnatural condition. The animal knows only one condition, that in which it lives. Therefore, it adapts to it, adjusts to it, 
and gradually becomes capable of perpetuating it for its own progeny. With the human being, confusion is a more common problem. The human being, with all of his neighbors and associates, constitutes a unit of individualism that is often dramatic and dangerous. The human being does as he pleases, not as he should. He does not worry or consider the effect of his conduct on other people. He feels that he is intended for certain ends, and these ends he will accomplish at all costs. His favorite ends are wealth, power, and fame. These are the things that he really considers to be the great realities. Animals don't seem to suffer from this peculiar absurdity at all. Uh, they are not particularly interested in wealth, except to put a few ch uh, chestnuts away for the winter. The, grand, the great careerism, which has dominated humanity from the beginning, and has given us nearly 8,000 wars in the records of history, this type of thing is unknown outside of our own kingdom. And it is one of the reasons why our kingdom is always staggering along under a tremendous adversity of one kind or another. Now, how are we going to estimate the problem? How are we going to decide what the individual should be and what he should do? Now, to try to face this problem is immediately to bring down upon one's head the wrath of his neighbors. Each person is convinced that everyone else should do what he wants them to do. To differ from him is a mistake. To differ loudly and clearly is anarchy. The, each person has a unique correctness in his own thinking. This correctness has nothing to do, actually, with the study of his own inner life. It is simply the de decision and determination to accomplish the goals which he has set for himself. The worst part of it all is that most of these goals have to be temporary. The human being's ambitions are very illusional. His career is an illusion because he can only maintain it for a comparatively short time. So we begin to say what is the difference between maturity and what we might call growing up. Maturity must be building in something that survives the vicissitudes of age. Age and maturity are not synonymous terms. The elder is not mature. The elder is simply older in years. But he does not necessarily represent a person of greater personal maturity. Maturity, therefore, demands an individual taking hold of his own life and making it significant. Significant of things which are the best that he knows. The other kingdoms have no best and no worst because they do not know. Man, however, can create his own kind of life. He can create his own kind of civilization, his own kind of empire. He has the right gradually to change things according to his heart's desire. But while he is doing all this, he must realize that he is doing these things under a vast canopy of inevitables. The things that he does that he should not do will not succeed. The things that he neglects to do that should he should do are the things that might have succeeded. Little by little, the human being is breaking away from the rulership of the laws of existence. He is breaking these laws largely for the gratification of ambition and appetite. And the more he does this and the more consistently he continues it, the more miserable he becomes. So I think Confucius, perhaps, and Lao Tse and Mencius were very wise in certain things. Namely, that the beginning of a good life, probably, is to realize that we come into this world only part way along a great evolutionary path. We are not on the summit of eternity. We are somewhere in the lower foothills. We are not now ready for that supreme fulfillment 
uh, that we constantly feel that we're entitled to, even though we've done nothing to earn it. We are not actually as wise as we think we are, and we are not as prepared for decisions as we believe we are. Most people are quite certain that they are being imposed upon by their doctor, their lawyer, and all these various professions that serve them. But they do not realize that they are imposing upon themselves and that the very traits that they resent in others are in, in themselves also and will be there until they're weeded out. We have to begin to think in terms of what the difference is between human beings and members of lower kingdoms. The members of lower kingdoms live within a universal protection in which the fact that they are small children, in a sense, permits them to receive continual guidance from a power that is never able to fail because of its innate integrity. Therefore, all these lower kingdoms are small children who must gradually grow up through one degree after another of growth and unfoldment. But this growth and unfoldment is guided, guarded and protected by laws which these creatures cannot break and which they have no instinct to break. There is no particular ambition in an animal except to protect the small area uh, which is its field of activity. It has to protect its own region, its own family, because in so doing, he protects the continuation of his own particular lifeline. This problem of territory has been gradually unfolded in the case of humanity until the world becomes a territory and is at the disposal of anyone who can conquer it. Therefore, to us, territory is not to protect our own, but to fulfill our ambitions, aggra aggravate our various emotions, and develop great financial resources. We take territory to enslave it. The animal takes no such attitude. He uses the natural resources as they are. He only sets aside for himself that which is sufficient for the needs of his own immediate brood. Thus, there is a great difference in these points. Animals, birds, and fish, and flowers, uh, trees, all have strange integrities because they are fulfilling the purpose for which they were fashioned. This brings us to the question that man alone tries to answer. What is the purpose for which we were created? Why are we here? What are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to span these years that make up our physical embodiment? We look around us and we hold, we hold something that should temper us but does not. And that is, of all creatures, we are the only ones that know we are impermanent. Other creatures have no realization of the future. They only have the case the key of survival until something destroys them. And in the animal kingdom, the very young and the very old uh, have to pay the penalties of inevitables. But the human being has now developed an attitude that is quite different from this. He is also under the same laws. He cannot survive, but he's going to change what he does while he is here and make it serve him to the fulfillment of every ambition and appetite that he can cause to arise within himself. Therefore, the human being is not trying to be mature. He is trying to be old enough to make mistakes. And with some exceptions, he does pretty well at it. He does make many, many mistakes. But the problem of trying to outgrow the mistakes is the problem of growing up. We have to gradually learn from the things that happen to us. We have to learn from experience, which the animal cannot do. He learns entirely by instinct, but not by conscious experience. With us, we have the right to perform a variety of actions 
measure the results and, comp and create a, a pattern suitable for the extension of our own probabilities. We have the right to plan a future that will give us the greatest security, the greatest growth, the greatest unfoldment of our own internal potential, and enable us to make the greatest possible donation to the common good. Now these are about all the things that are worthwhile doing, and yet these are not the things that the average person is doing. Now this problem of responsibility does not interfere with personal happiness or well-being. Man is capable of being happy. It's very unlikely that animals have any great sense of unhappiness or happiness. Some of them probably have a contentment when they are able to have sufficient food and their little families and broods are in good order. Man, however, has a capacity not only to organize his life, but to be happy in many of the things that he can do. But he must also measure a happiness. What does it take to make him happy? If happiness demands that he injures others, then he is in serious trouble. If happiness means that he must waste his own potential and lose health and mental and emotional integrities, then he is wrong. Uh, happiness has to arise from order, from things being done correctly in their own way, purposes being fulfilled, and the individual rejoicing in his adherence to those principles which are sound and proper. So we have now this little difficulty that comes along in our affairs, the problem of trying to see what we can do to get some of these mistakes corrected before they become too dangerous. Now there is hardly any person, for instance today, that doesn't realize the dangers of alcoholism. He knows these things. He also realizes that he reads in the papers now almost every day warnings against cigarette smoking. Now, animals don't have any such warnings because, of course, they don't do these things. But man having done them and having the warning makes a decision. If he decides that his own pleasure is more important than the warning and the risks he takes are more than justified by the results of, of his own achievements, then he will probably keep on making these mistakes. And then one day, the axe falls. Something happens that he cannot any longer avoid or evade, and he discovers that he has wasted a life. Now, how can we assume a mature people to maintain institutions, organizations, procedures, policies, attitudes, and systems that they know are not right. There again, there has to be a compromise because the person is firmly of the belief that what he is doing is affording him immediate comfort, immediate success, immediate happiness, and immediate personal satisfaction. Therefore, the immediate takes precedent over the eminent. That which is now is the only thing uh, that becomes important. If he can be happy or think he is happy, now he has fulfilled life. No way can this be regarded as a symbol of maturity. The individual may be well along in years, maybe with white hair and a long beard, but if he is not thinking, if he is not working to do something of value to himself and others, he is not growing more mature, he is simply becoming gradually older and more infirm. And the most infirm person can be the one in a hundred percent good health, but with nothing inside but a vast ignorance. The individual does not become mature because he copies the delinquencies of older people. He is not developing any values if things which are not valuable amuse and entertain him and to satisfy his life. This doesn't mean he has to go around with a long face, nor does he have to wander about in a state of constant overwhelmed responsibility. These are not the problems. But he must, to be truly happy, be useful, constructive, 
and enjoy as much good health as possible. The moment health begins to deteriorate, happiness vanishes also. And most people who have achieved certain physical success, if health fails, find that they are very, very poor. So it becomes necessary for people, each person to prepare a concept of maturity. Well, we can say for one thing that maturity is the ability to live one's life constructively. It is the right to be right. It is the right to do those things which are the greatest good to all concerned. Maturity is thoughtfulness, discrimination, integrity. Maturity is to outgrow the fallacies of life and correct the improprieties of life. Maturity is the person using his inner potential for the greater good of all concerned. Maturity must be the release of internal constructive potential. Without this, the body is a hindrance and a pain. The body is useful only because it enables us to do the things that the mind and emotions feel that we should do. And if the mind and emotions are immature, the body will soon show signs of deterioration through dissipation. So we have to try to find out now what constitutes a good mature person. Well, I think we find maturity in many of the great teachers of the world. I think we find maturity in Confucius, who was one of the first to declare the values of life as far as the Eastern world is concerned. Confucius makes it very simple, very direct, that we are all here to help each other. And maturity is to achieve a distinguished reputation for collective contribution to good. A mature family is one in which the principles are clearly enunciated. A mature family is where the parents respect each other and the children respect the parents. A mature family is one in which there is religion, dedication to principles, and most of all, a keeping of all those rules and, com and commandments by which society remains secure. The good family, the mature family, will never contribute to delinquency, nor deliver, contribute to crime. Of course, according to Confucius, the formalities, the proprieties, were the basis of maturity. Maturity is an expression of gratitude, it is the individual meeting his personal responsibilities, not because he has to, but because he recognizes that they are right. Maturity is the person contributing to the needs of others whenever necessary. And also maturity is the inner conviction which enables a person to sacrifice his own life, if necessary, for the security of something more important. Maturity, therefore, is a grown-up person and the way you can tell them, usually, is not because they walk around like the Chinese Manchus in high boots. The, the proof of it is their relationships with life. What they do, what they think, what they say, what they believe. Maturity is therefore many things. Maturity is thank you for a service rendered. Maturity is a reward for good done. Maturity is respect for authority, expect a respect for, le for age. Maturity is a parental attitude to youth wherever it may be. Uh, the mature person worships deity through kindness, gentleness, integrity. And maturity also often brings with it an appreciation for the arts, music, literature, all kinds of refined things. The mature person rules his own family wisely and lovingly. And each of the members of the family respects the others and also respects the potential within themselves which must be developed if the person is to become a mature individual. So Confucius put maturity as something to us would be almost perfection, something beyond anything we can really appreciate. But it's not true at all. Maturity is simply the individual reacting to his own internal endowments. 
Maturity is the use of the mind constructively, the use of the emotions constructively, and the care of the body with discipline, or at least with consideration. Therefore, a mature person does not make common mistakes. They do not have bad dispositions. They are not confirmed warriors. They are not jealous of each other. They are not uh, contentious in their attitudes. They do not create riots. They are not given to crime. They do not attempt to take what they have not earned. And when they work, they do an honest day's work. These things make maturity. Maturity has nothing to do with wealth. It has nothing to do with physical office. It really has nothing to do primarily with years because maturity can extend over a long period of time. Maturity does not necessarily fade out with age either. The individual who is basically mature, who has not merely blocked his mistakes, but has outgrown them, will even in the closing years of life have the gentility, the thoughtfulness, the kindness, and the sincerity appropriate to his in internal achievements. Now, somewhere in this pattern of things, we have the archetype of the human being. And nearly all philosophies and religions have worked on this archetype in one way or another to try to see how it can be turned in the direction most necessary. One of the things that helped a lot in the old days was religion. Religion in old times was a little bit more like the instinct of the animal. Primitive religions were things that were held by a kind of internal recognition. Uh, early religions were never justified by argument and never sustained by elaborate philosophical speculations. Uh, most primitive religions were simply natural human reactions to problems. The need for certain basic values and intent integrities. Uh, well, there was a certain loyalty in primitive religion. There was a certain natural defense of the clan or the brood family. The protection of the weak and kindness to the old and patience with the young. These were natural attributes which were gradually theologized, but which were well established before theologies came into existence. And by degrees, religion changes. Integrities within the individual alter his theological acceptances. He is no longer willing to take certain beliefs that are inconsistent with the higher integrity of himself. If he has really come to realize that he can love all human beings for the, bed, the good that is in them, he can no longer belong to a faith that damns half of them. He can no longer be part of something which is unworthy of his own natural internal growth. Thus, uh, religion is censored by the maturity of the individual, by experiences and by integrities, also by observation and tradition. Another value, as Lord Bacon points out in this matter, is to understand or study the history of the human race. We make a mistake to assume that we have outgrown humanity, that we are now on a high pinnacle of achievement, we are not an outgrowing humanity at the moment. We are one that stands puzzled and uncertain. At crossroads, we do not know which way to turn. Therefore, it is advisable for every person to have a fair understanding of the values which have sustained humanity from the beginning. As we become more aware of how the best have lived, we can gain something about what is the best way to live. And we can do this by study, by contemplation. We can do this by studying in philosophy, in religion, in science, and on all forms of thoughtfulness, so that we have discrimination, that we can take our own partly developed faculties and advance them by study of the common good and all that has gone before. We do not have to start again with the most primitive levels of, of ethics or morality. We can gain these knowledges from the experiences of our forebears. We gain them from histories, biographies, even a great deal of poetry and legendary can contribute. 
we gradually come to the point where we are now. We come to the point where we can no longer simply accept the past. We have to do something about it. It's true, of course, that we it may have stopped growing long before we caught up the best of the past. But we have done this and that and what we could and have come to a point of certain decisions within ourselves. We certainly must finally come to the decision that certain things fail inevitably and other things succeed even though it takes longer to bring the success about. Having decided a little bit about this problem of integrities, we can consider, for instance, the religious life of our present time. Every day there is someone comes along with a new revelation of one kind or another. We don't know what to do about it. We have no way of judging whether these people are correct or not. We do not know whether this book is the greatest thing in the modern world or whether it is someone's aberration. We have no way of knowing unless we have a pattern of integrities inside ourselves. If we start on the assumption that we believe everything we hear, we will soon be in trouble. If we reject everything we hear, we may also be in trouble. But without discrimination of our own, we are always in trouble. So where we come to a decision, and we get people every day practically who will phone in or write in and say they have a new volume that's just out that is simply wonderful, and what do we think of it? Well, in the first place, how can we say what we think of it? We haven't read it, probably. But in any event, the point is they shouldn't be phoning in. If they don't know whether it is good or not, there is something lacking in those instincts which even animals have, the recognition of realities. If they find in a book a various efforts to escape responsibility, if it is filled with promises that cannot be fulfilled, if it is constantly luring the person to further physical securities, advantages, or opulence, then there is every reason to feel that it is simply contributing to the misery of mankind. We must have some basic integrity in ourselves before we can even read a new book safely. We have to have principle. We have to have some kind of a firm belief in values or we cannot estimate the values of other people. When we review books or when various people interpret them, uh, this is usually a very unfortunate experience because we do not know the book. We probably do not know the reviewer, and the reviewer himself may not know what he's talking about. The result is a great success economically, but a miserable failure ethically. So we have to have in ourselves certain basic standards that we will not compromise. One of these standards is to avoid anything that promises great rewards for small efforts, to, do, to be rewarded for doing nothing, or to have your various mistakes nullified without self-improvement. These things begin to make problems, and sincere people seek to avoid them. We want to know more of that which is real. We want to know more that will contribute to the enlightenment of ourselves and the improvement of society. We want things that help us to grow, to become mature persons. And maturity never seeks evasions or avoidances. Mature persons never look for shortcuts. They do not believe in rewards they have not earned. And they are very cautious in the development of those extrasensory perceptions which can be so easily distorted and fabricated. So the person himself has to have a certain amount of maturity or he can't go any further. He cannot make the next step unless he knows what he has already accomplished. He must make one step at a time, but he must have stepped from one secure position to another or else he will drift into some kind of a quicksand. The uh, problem then with each person, if he is not yet completely aware of values, he must accept maturity as a natural instinct to learn. 
He must want to know. He mustn't be sitting back complacently believing that he knows more than anyone else. The beginning of maturity is the desire to improve and therefore to use all legitimate means to find out how to improve. And nearly always the best sources of information come from those whose careers and whose achievements over periods of ages have earned the respect, confidence, and belief of mankind.